All righty. So this is the first presentation for our second theme, virology. When I was thinking of kind of things to talk about, what immediately came to mind was some work that I originally did when I was at UNC. I was in the gene therapy center there for maybe less than a year. Um, honestly, I was not the most engaged in that research that I did there, unfortunately. I just was really busy with a lot of other stuff that was happening at the same time. But the main thing that that group was working on was the use of adeno-associated viruses. And that's something that's fairly new. So I thought it'd be an interesting topic to kind of broach, especially because we can kind of connect it to what my dad presented on last week in regards to kind of product development and kind of seeing how research has come along in a certain period of time. I mentioned earlier in the chat that I had kind of shifted gears. I realized that there is a lot of kind of nuance to how this virus works, but I think in terms of nitty gritty, you're better off just reading the paper or other sources. And I am better off kind of interpreting a bunch of different articles that I kind of compiled. I uploaded the two that were most relevant, but there are just like maybe like 10 total that I kind of went through to kind of get a bigger scope of what a DNA associated virus therapy is looking like right now and from when it was first discovered. So without further ado, let's jump right in. So as per usual, I have my good old objective slide and an animated boy. Um, the main thing here that I wanted was to understand the general characteristics of adeno-associated viruses. Well, I'll just probably say AAV from now on, or AV. Um, then kind of go through three parts of its sort of history in the discovery and sequencing part, how it started becoming useful in recombinant um, theory, and then finally some FDA approved therapies that exist slash kind of what that's looking like right now, the scope of research right now, and then kind of just review how that's progressed in the last couple of years, or I guess more so in the last two decades, um, and then how that's going to be moving forward. And as usual, if you have any questions at all, stop me. If I'm not speaking clearly enough, let me know. Okay, so I'm going to start with this nice timeline. So the Wang article listed below was one of the main ones I used. It was kind of looking at kind of what I'm going to be talking about today, which is the progression of adeno-associated virus therapy across its pretty much existence. Um, it is fairly new. So the discovery of the first AAV was in around 1965 when they were actually looking at adenoviruses, which is a whole separate kind of subsection of using viruses for gene therapy. But they originally just thought it was like kind of like little contaminants um, and weren't really like a big deal almost. They kind of were like, oh, this is kind of curious that there are little things here that aren't, you know, doing anything. They're immunologically distinct from any other antigens, but really kind of just are there in a certain sense. So it really wasn't until the 1980s when we really started getting some like projects in there. And even then it's kind of almost like a pet project for a lot of people. And you can see kind of the gap here. So it took about 10 years for the cloning and sequencing of just one of the serotypes. Then we started seeing, oh, it's possible for vector design. That still took a whole decade there. And then we really only saw kind of application research in the 90s, finally coming to the 2000s where it kind of really became its own thing, its own subsect of um, biotherapy. And we'll kind of go explore piece by piece through this timeline up until present. In contrast, by the way, the first, I think, virus itself was the tobacco mosaic virus, which I think was around the 1890s. So in terms of like research scope, that's kind of how different they are. You know, we've had a heads up on viruses for about 150 years prior to this. And even then we kind of were able to visually see, oh, this is a virus. This is something we should probably treat versus this is something where it's like, what does it even do? Then one of the motifs I kind of will touch upon is the idea of like intention and kind of figuring out when to classify what to focus on, like prioritization of research, for example. So going on to the discovery, here are some kind of major milestones for that first period when we're kind of getting into the research of it. So like I mentioned before, it was discovered while prepping some adenoviruses for some other research. and originally just kind of classified as some contaminant and weren't really, you know, important at all to the people who were originally researching it. But 
lo and behold, someone's curiosity got the better of them and realized that it didn't really seem similar to any other antigens for the adenoviruses. So it was technically distinct. It wasn't really a contaminant or like a byproduct. It was something utterly distinct that was just found at the same time. Um, and I believe that's when they found the first about three serotypes. And the biggest one is AAV2, and that'll kind of come up a lot. It's the one that was really focused on and is still focused on just because it's really prevalent and was rather easy to understand at the beginning. By 1982, this is when we kind of had the sequencing done, and we realized something interesting was that these AAV were able to integrate themselves into chromosomes, which was kind of a big deal and almost consistently doing it. It wasn't at a very high frequency, but enough for people to be like, oh, this is something worth looking into as like, kind of like, oh, you know, gene therapy up and coming. How can we use this to, you know, get people to inherit better genes or kind of fix genes or so on and so forth. Come 1984, we had the first kind of success with establishing it as a vector for um, some antibiotic resistance for neomycin. Nothing too crazy here. I don't think that really went anywhere, but it did show that it was a viable vector, which kind of kick-started more studies and more research into it, which really starts revealing what's more interesting about AAVs. Um, in 1990, this is kind of a sidestep almost, but it did show some positive abilities to kill cancer cells without harming healthy ones. Shout out to our first theme. Um, but the main thing here was that the serotypes that they found, while they all consistently integrated in, into a, the same spot on the human chromosome, like chromosome 19, they also were able to impact a lot of different types of cells. So each serotype had a different set of, you know, receptors that allowed them to attach to different parts of cells. You know, some were related to hepatic cells, some were more closer attached to airway epithelial cells. A lot of interesting ways of seeing how specific it was and nonspecific at the same time. So that being said, what exactly are they? You know, I didn't really talk about that. So at this point, we kind of had a better understanding of what they actually were and that these are very small viruses with a capsule size of about 20 nanometers. In contrast, that usual typical phage that we see with the little pronged legs and the isohedron head, that's about more closer to about 100, I think, nanometers, maybe 150 at most. Um, and in terms of kilobase pairs, these only had a linear single-stranded DNA genome of about five kilobase pairs. In contrast, usual phages, like I think the one I'm thinking about is like the E. coli one, um, usually around 150. So these are very, very small. And the reason why they were found with the adenoviruses and why they're adeno-associated viruses is because they actually do not encode polymerases themselves. So they're kind of almost symbiotic, I guess more parasitic if anything, because they don't, they just kind of take, but they need helper viruses or other cellular stresses to actually do anything and to, you know, be a virus effectively. So otherwise they're fairly benign. And that kind of, all the things I kind of listed so far kind of help me sum up why they're so important. Because they're so benign, they have a low immune system response. Because of that ability to stably integrate into that chromosome 19, even though it is a low frequency, it's still pretty impressive that it's so consistent. Um, and this is likely due to a very specific binding motif. And then again, with the different serotypes, you're able to infect a wide variety of cells pretty consistently. And finally, when it does get going, it's pretty high yield. Um, I think the numbers I have here are about 100K particles per cell. I couldn't really get a good understanding of what average numbers were for other viruses and things like that. But again, given that it's 20 nanometers small, it's pretty efficient. And it, within the body itself, it is fairly prevalent. I think about 40 to 80% of people have, I think, immunity or serotype presence of some AAV already. So kind of looking ahead, what this is allowing us to do is really provide treatment for really specific um, inherited diseases, things like cystic fibrosis, hemophilia, arthritis. Um, and it really stretches from inherited to non-inherited things from really, you know, pervasive systemic issues to more localized issues. There really is a lot of like flexibility 
And there are some weaknesses, but we will talk about them later. But I think some of the strengths are just like really wild. Some can pass through the blood brain barrier. Some can impact stem cells. Most, I think there's none that actually cause any human diseases as we know it. So there really is just a lot of positives right off the bat. So here's the general transduction mechanism for how they're taken in to their host. So there's a lot kind of happening here, but the main things that really differentiate it from other cells kind of happen more so within the nucleus. Otherwise, pretty simple, you have your receptors, some conformational changes depending on pH. Eventually, the AAV itself is released um, extrachromosally. Sometimes it is broken down by proteasomes into peptides, but a lot of times it's able to actually enter in through the nuclear core complex and then kind of do its thing. Two big versions of AAVs that exist right now, and this kind of will come back when we talk about manufacturing them, are single-stranded AAVs and then uh, self-complementary AAVs. So as I mentioned before, very, very small, right? So small kilobase size. So you really can't hold a lot of information in them. So one way people kind of got around that was actually breaking them down into the positive sense and anti-sense strands, and then having kind of like two sets of AAVs that you use. And then once you get both of them into the nucleus, they'll do some second strand synthesis to actually create the full um, double-stranded DNA to be useful. Otherwise, there are also methods of being kind of more efficient and elegant and making the self-complementary AAV, which are double standard or double stranded by design and actually use some intramolecular annealing to become their full form for lack of a better word. Um, and here at a certain point, the viral ITRs will drive recombination to make circular monomers or dimers or what so have you. And then some of these at a low frequency are integrated into a host genome, but otherwise these will act extra chromosomally and express themselves. Any questions about this mechanism? I will answer to the best of my ability. <laughs> okay, so that's kind of the gist of how they work. They're really not too much different from regular viruses in that regard. Um, but yeah, so what are some ways we can use this? Or like, what are the key things we have to do here? So we have to make, obviously, recombinant AAVs. We don't want whatever they're doing right now, because they're really not doing that much. But if we can get a good transgene in them, we can have some good therapeutic benefits to apply themselves. So main thing here, we're really not doing too much different than what is the wild type AAVs look like. So we have the capsid, we have the DNA. Um, the big things here are replacing the protein codes for something that is more therapeutic. And here I just kind of listed the basic simple gene expression structure. There really isn't anything super crazy here. It is the base structure, but that's kind of another thing is that it maintains the really basic needs of a virus to exist. So the history got kind of fuzzy for me in the late 90s. There was just a lot happening at that point. But as far as I can tell, this is the first time we saw application of recombinant AAVs in humans. And the main one I found was therapy for cystic fibrosis via the transfer of nebulized AAVs into their throats. And at that point, it was showing actually surprisingly good results. It seemed like it was safe. Um, and there's also a lot of other things happening at the same time. We saw the use of human beta globulin in mice, which was able to kind of provide some positive impacts on erythro cells. And there was just a lot happening at this point, but this was really the big one that kind of showed that, you know, this is something that we can use in humans and not, it's just some like side project for people. We'll kind of come back to this. This kind of becomes, historic and other senses when we kind of come back and look review what studies looked like at that point because obviously things like you know guidelines for gene therapy have changed a lot since the 90s and that will come up later but i just wanted to put that up now because there are some issues that this wasn't perfect basically so what are the big remaining issues other than the ones i'm alluding to right now packaging and execution so the big things here 
like I mentioned before, AAVs rely a lot on helper viruses. And it's really difficult to kind of maintain safety when you have to, you know, give other viruses at the same time. And then the other issue is the development of new capsids. So like I mentioned earlier, 40 to 80% of the human population are already seropositive for some antibody slash immunity towards AAVs of some kind. As far as right now, I think we have identified about 11 AAVs, eight of which are naturally endemic to humans. So naturally, there are some antibodies that we already have for almost eight of these. So while there are still, you know, those three that we can use, it really is important that we kind of work on discovering new ways to see how we can target these AAVs and find new approaches to, you know, things we already kind of figured out is that, you know, cystic fibrosis can be treated, but what about things like Parkinson's and hemophilia and other genetic d diseases that we're looking at? So what does that look like? What is, what is, you know, development of an AAV look like? So first we're gonna start with a capsid because that's kind of the big thing here. The real big difference between the serotypes really kind of lies in the capsid. So despite being only about three vial proteins big, the genetic markers here really determine pretty much everything about it in terms of targeting. And there are kind of four philosophies, I suppose, to figuring out, you know, development of these capsids right now. And the biggest focus obviously is in, you know, changing these genetic markers and for more specific transduction in specific cells and obviously kind of bypassing the immunity we just talked about. So first, directed evolution. This one's pretty simple. Honestly, it almost seems kind of haphazard. A lot of the times it's like capsid shuffling, you're getting a bunch of capsids, you're fragmenting them down, you're reconstructing them in different ways, you're doing error prone PCR, kind of letting nature do its work in a certain sense but obviously having some handle on, okay, these are the, these are the serotypes I'm working with right now. Let's see how these can mute it, like mutagens, what can happen here? So yeah, here is a focus on mutagenesis and then some fragmenting and then reassembling to see how these can form new types of capsids. The second, obviously discovering more natural types. We've found 11 so far. I think it has slowed down a lot. Like I mentioned, there's three at the beginning. The last one was found, I think, in 2006, and that was the 11th one. And I don't think there's really been a lot more since. The main thing here, really, is that this is kind of going out of fashion because, like I mentioned before, if we're looking for them, there is some natural immunity in humans that have them. And otherwise, if they're not, you know, originally in humans, the actual application of them might not be as useful as we think. But there is obviously a lot of promise in, you know, finding an AAV that's really natural in your human liver. And immediately that's like, a, okay, we can use this to, you know, further work on focusing on hepatic cells. We just can modify it further to really bypass the immunity. So there is a lot of importance in finding these base serotypes to work with. And that's kind of why this region still exists. C and D are some of the more bigger focuses. So two of the main articles that I focused on was one from 2008 and one from 2019. And that was to kind of get a better understanding of what really changed in that last decade. And what I saw was these two really coming to the forefront. The first, rational design. This is kind of engineering at its finest. You are manually grafting on peptide sequences. You are scaffolding new amino acids. You are manually changing the receptors that are involved in determining whether this is something that can be transduced or not. There's also a lot of cool, like, bioinformatics that are kind of happening more so in the in silico design area where you are looking at serotypes but then analyzing the really variable regions of them and seeing oh these are parts that we can you know mess around with tolerate some manipulation and voila we have something new to work with so really kind of evolving off of these methods and these will always have their places but this is kind of what things have been like really moving towards because it is a lot more controlled in a certain sense. And I think one interesting thing is that, again, a lot of this is really foundational. Like we did kind of start here, or we started here, went here, so on and so forth in terms of kind of evolving the process of how we determine these stereotypes and, you know, manipulating these receptors. One interesting example was that 
they took AAV2 in children who already showed immunity to it and then found out what kind of was left over for when they were presented with AAV2. So basically the parts of AAV2 that the immunity didn't really necessarily resolve immediately or after a certain period of time. Using those residues, they actually then kind of came back to this idea of rational design and were able to graft on a newer version of AAV2. And I thought that was really cool because it shows, one, that we're learning from what we're doing again, but also that there is a lot of simplicity to this design of AAVs that you just really wouldn't be able to do as easily with other viruses. So kind of moving on from there a little bit, what are some big research overarching kind of like summaries that I can give you right now? So down here is another really nice uh, figure that shows the percentages of current trials that are in certain phases, what parts of the body they're focusing on, what serotype they're really relying on right now. Like I mentioned before, AV2 is really big, but we are seeing a lot of work on other types. And there are some here that are, I believe are, again, grafted on versions or manipulated versions to be a new type of AAV. Big focus on the eyes, liver, and muscle right now. There are specific reasons for why these were. I didn't have the best understanding of why. My understanding so far is that AV2 on its own has specific parts of the body that it really does focus on immediately. And a lot of those are musculoskeletal, so I believe that explains the whole relevance here. As far as the eyes and livers, the livers are interesting in that they have just so much blood flow that they kind of encourage a lot of AAV production once you do get it in there. Um, as far as cell turnover, though, I think that was one of the issues they're working on, but provided a good, you know, feel to kind of test, oh, how can we get AAVs to last longer and provide therapeutic benefit for a longer period of time? Eyes are another interesting part. There is a lot of success with intravitreal injections. That's something I actually personally worked on. And there has been research that's shown that AV vectors could actually replenish night blindness for mice as of right now. I think that's a pretty recent discovery. I think it was in 2015, um, but showed pretty good results also in human models. And then obviously, you have the et cetera things. Brains, obviously is always a good target to focus on because there's so much happening there. And again, the ability to cross the blood-brain barrier with some of these AAVs, really powerful stuff. So there's a lot of research happening there. Kind of going on to some landmark approvals and therapies that are happening right now. There are, I believe, four big ones right now. Um, and I, There's five listed here, but one will be taken off immediately. Um, and that's Gilbera. So Gilbera is interesting. Uh, but really was the first of its kind in providing gene therapy. These first two were done in Europe and were approved by the European Medicines Agency. Uh, I don't really feel the need to go super deeply into what they were treating. I don't, obviously these were kind of big things. There were a lot of deficiencies, therapy. So lipoprotein, lipase deficiency, having that um, can cause severe pancreatitis, obviously immunodeficiency in this case, Retinal dystrophy and spinal muscular atrophy can explain themselves, I believe. But the big thing here is that, you know, this is all fairly recent. You know, that's eight years ago. And then for, as far as the U.S. goes, it wasn't until three years ago that we had Mux Turner. So kind of coming back to what's happening right now is that we're finally seeing, like, the fruit of what was done in the 90s of, you know, finally doing tests in humans, seeing, okay, these are things that we can do. Let's start some trials, and then finally those trials are finally showing fruit now. The main thing here is that you know gene therapy is, again, kind of scary in a certain sense. There's a lot to work with, so there is a reason why these take so long. But at the same time, there's also a lot that needs to be still figured out. I think it was only in February of this year where the FDA provided six new major guidelines for manufacturing and quality control. I think they're still allowing non-GMP AAVs for the base development of a lot of um, therapies right now. There's just a lot to work on in terms of really getting this up to speed with where, you know, things like retrobiotic therapy are looking at, where, you know, as regular antibiotics are. There's just a lot to catch up on. And I believe, oh, actually, we'll, we'll kind of come back to this. So 
back in 1990, what was it, was it? I'm gonna go back a couple steps, 1995, um, we had this landmark application. What a Cochrane review in 2016 did realize was apparently, while not necessarily not unsafe, they didn't necessarily see enough of a therapeutic benefit to really justify the use of nebulizers for cystic fibrosis patients who are already obviously struggling with, you know, respiratory infections and things like that. So one of the big things that I think I kind of saw as I was going through all these research was that, again, clinical benefit versus, you know, statistical significance in terms of benefits, right? Something could be statistically significant doesn't necessarily mean it's therapeutically beneficial to immediately apply it. And, and that's not to say that was the case for every research done in this time, but that was something I've noticed both in this sector of research, which is research as a whole, and it's something obviously that's a big deal for gene therapy right now. It's figuring out, is this something we really want to, you know, put out there, especially when Gilbera, when it first came out, cost about a million dollars to actually go through a full course of treatment. Um, eventually, it was shut down, and the remaining three doses they had were put out for one euro each. Um, and that goes to show, I think, how difficult it is to get these out there right now. Because one, you don't have a strong foundation of research to really work with. You're really breaking a lot of new ground, and that means a lot of newer forms of manufacturing you have to go through, a lot of man hours spent just to kind of get things working. There's a lot here that just is a really big limiting factor. And that kind of leads to what I'm gonna talk about now. <laughs> so here are some limitations that I've actually seen that have been addressed, which I did wanna start out with because I think this was really interesting to look at. So first, going back to what I was talking about in terms of size limitation, you got five kilobase pairs to work with, not a lot. Um, what people have done was, you know, Structure defines function to a great extent, right? But people have found that you are able to kind of get around this with partially functional genes. And I put that in quotations because I think it's kind of disingenuous. They are functional. You're just really cutting down the nitty gritty of like what you really need. And I think that's really great because one, it forces people to be a lot more efficient. Obviously in the grand scheme of manufacturing, people don't want to be efficient all the time. And sometimes that could be more costly than not. But it really does provide a better understanding of what you really need for a gene to be therapeutic. And it allows for bigger genes to be placed into these AAVs and still do their thing. The other option is going back to what I was talking about, positive sense and anti-sense strands. You can co-administer two AAV vectors and effectively double your carrying capacity. Combine that with partially functional genes and you can get a lot larger of a gene than what you would originally think into your capsids. Another limitation, helper viruses that are needed can be less safe. Obviously, the more factors you put in, the less safe you know your system is, the more factors you kind of have to deal with when you're testing things. So kind of going back to, again, of being efficient, there's a lot of codon optimization that needed to be done to enhance gene expression. You suddenly learn, oh, these are what parts that you really need to you know, amplify gene expression. You know, These are parts I don't really need. But Oh, excuse me. And then you can obviously look at more changing other parts of the like cell itself. So changing the promoter to be more tissue or cell specific. And I think one thing that I had to kind of understand was that, again, this is so simplistic that you really can change a lot of these pretty easily and pretty quickly. So being efficient or learning to be efficient in these small scale experiments really can be extrapolated pretty well to larger scale too, once you get down to it. You just, you know, start small, work it up. Then finally, they, the limiting factor of what I mentioned earlier, they do integrate into host chromosomes, but at a very low frequency. And because it's such a low frequency slash, it's not necessarily a reliable integration, especially once you start modifying the gene expression itself, a lot of times they'll actually remove the genes and parts that would allow it to integrate into the chromosome, even though it is a powerful ability, allowing it to do partially or at such a small amount can be kind of unsafe. Like unsafe. So they usually do just exist extra chromosomally 
and it means they can't be used in cells that are going to perform mitosis. So while they're still powerful, that's something we do kind of want to work on because it's such an interesting part of what makes AAV so strong. And in recent history, um, specifically about 2019, so about a year ago, people were beginning to use CRISPR-Cas9 to induce breaks into the cell line DNA to promote the integration. So kind of increase that frequency at what it was doing. And you know, as far as they prevailed to figure out, that was pretty successful in small scale experiments. So again, showing, you know, there are things in research where you might not see it necessarily useful as first or like useful at first, but are like key characteristics that once you do work on can become very useful. And I think the ability to integrate into a host chromosome will be really powerful at the end of the day, just because you really won't have to care about whether the cell is performing mitosis or not. It'll, it'll just work for lack of a better phrase. So some current challenges, like I mentioned before, it's expensive. Um, Gilbera was about $1 million. I think Luxturna, which was a 2017 drug, really not much better. I think it was about 400K per eye. Um, and that was the one for retinal dystrophy. Still very expensive. And you really, obviously people can't afford that. I mean, insurance is only gonna cover so much. So why is it so expensive other than the, obviously the research that's put into it? The current method of preparing an AAV is based primarily in triple cones transfection, founded at UNC, by the way, or really revolutionized at UNC. Um, and that is using three different plasmids to really get your AAV working. So that's one plasmid with the essential AAV genes, one with the expression sequence with the transgene, the therapeutic one that you want, and then a helper plasmid to kind of replace you know, the helper virus. And that gets you all the factors, obviously, but then you need to prepare three separate plasmids for one cell. Um, that's a lot. That can be a lot of work. And also, while the yield of particles is really great once you get it going, in terms of forming caspids themselves, that's obviously separate from the three plasmids we're looking at here. The caspids themselves are very hard to construct, even despite being simple. The yields as of right now tend to be kind of poor, and you end up with a lot of empty capsids which kind of useful in the sense that you can kind of use them to gauge, you know, your immunoresponse slash, you know, see how we can better adapt them to bypass the immune response. But again, when you're trying to get working versions of the AAV, not necessarily what you're really focusing on at the moment. So finding a new method for that would be something really big to work on right now. Obviously with triple transfection, I'm pretty sure being I think founded closer to around the 2000s, maybe like late 90s, still fairly new. I'm not sure what kind of room is left for there to be more efficient in this method versus finding a newer method. Yeah, that's a, that's a big question mark for me. I don't know. Uh, and I think that's something really interesting to look at is that you're always going to see, you know, things you can improve on. But in this case, it's like, how much more can we improve without you know, going to a completely new method. At this point, quality control is also pretty poor. I put FDA as mixed signals here, and I think that's because, like I mentioned before, they allow non-GMP um, plasmids for the base AAV, but they'll also put you on hold for months at a time if they see any small fragments of, you know, DNA fragments in a random trial you do. And that stranglehold slash these mixed signals can make it kind of difficult at times because obviously you never want to be on hold that this takes time. It's hard to kind of figure out what goes wrong sometimes. And I think these new guidelines that they're putting out are going to help a lot. But again, that was just this year. So it's going to be a while before we get a really smooth manufacturing process for a lot of these AAVs. We also need to do a lot of robust testing. I don't think I really need to say much more about gene therapy there's a lot happening here despite how simple these viruses are the immune system and someone's genes are really complicated so it is important that you know you see the importance of sex you find out the therapeutic windows you get your effective doses figure out whether you know your AAV really that specific as you think it is is it really is it you know sticking to those hepatic cells you want to or is it you know going a little bit further out somewhere else that's something to be worried about then finally Despite all of the things I've talked about getting bypass, you know, bypassing these immunological barriers, that's still an issue, um, mainly because we you know 
what we have found so far are AAVs that are naturally inherent to humans. And then you have all these interactions with the capsid, the genome of the protein product itself, interacting with, you know, amino responses at every level. And, you know, because they're so, for, again, lack of a better word, benign, they really, you know, as far as we know, don't cause any human diseases. They are really small. And as far as we know, really don't have much of an immune response. It's not really much of a safety concern, but also like an efficacy issue of like, if someone has a small amount of an immune response, again, with the yield being as poor as it is sometimes, despite, you know, how strong it could be, that can really provide an impact in the long run. And if you're paying 500K for your therapy, you probably want it to last a while, if not work altogether. So really getting, you know, the immune system factors down is really important as well in the coming future. And I think a big part of that is moving away from animal models. Again, I think that's something you can say about any type of research right now. And it's really difficult to kind of bypass that step, but really, obviously at the end of the day, if we wanted to work on humans, we need to work on humans to a certain extent. Um, and, you know, I think the biggest challenge is getting more research into it. Obviously it is a bigger thing now, but again, started in the 1960s, viruses and bacteria have been studied for centuries longer than that. So there's just a lot of work to do, but I think the rate at which it's catching up is really promising. And I think that's why, it's something to focus on in the upcoming years, especially with, you know, genes becoming one of those things that's no longer a fever dream of scientists. It's something that we can really work on. And I'm really gonna end on this. I don't have a better ending, I suppose, but this is a general model for the immunological barrier. I thought this was kind of an interesting figure. Really isn't too much different than what I posted earlier. It just shows kind of how uh, immune response can be created. So once that AAV gets in here, sometimes endosomes catch it, proteasome affects it, you got your peptides. The peptides are presented to your good old major histocompatibility complex, prevents it, presents it to you know CDA T cells, and then you have cytotoxic pressure on your AAV. So I think I wanted to show this because it's really not that much different than any other type of immune response. So because of that, you have to be careful again with the immune response is because again, because it's so small, because you need to really follow a very certain specific set of steps to get it to start showing a therapeutic benefit, having an immune response presented is already a big drawback. That's immediately something, a big hurdle that you have to kind of deal with. So because it's so simple to provide immune response as well, it's really important that we kind of, you know, work at bypassing that. So the simplicity really is a double-edged sword for AAVs, but I think that is really where its strength lies because we always talk about, you know, delving into what's complicated, delving into, you know, how we can get, you know, stronger versions of this and that, more complex versions of this and that. But I think going back to basics here is really important. And I think it'll show a lot of you know, improvements in other sectors as well. Like I mentioned before, you know, showing really strong improvements in codon optimization, you know, what your, how long your gene has to be for therapeutic benefit. There's a lot here that will improve not just viral therapy, but kind of just understanding viruses in general. And yeah, I think it's really interesting to see how that kind of all comes together. And yeah, that was pretty much it. I think I ran a little shorter than I thought I was going to, but there we go. Thank you so much for listening.